So my beloved brothers and sisters, and all the visitors and everyone who is gathered here, I wish first of all to thank the Lord for this very wonderful privilege which we have to worship the Lord on this holy Sabbath day. And it has always been privilege of God's people. The Lord has ordained it so because Jesus himself has said that Sabbath was given for whom? For men, that's right, for men. Sabbath is given for our good. And that's why the Lord is pleased. And we are rejoicing that he has given us this wonderful privilege to worship him on this holy Sabbath day. And I want to thank the Lord also, my dear brothers and sisters, that I am today with you. Um, We have just heard the sad news that this dear sister in China is in prison at the moment. I feel very much for our Chinese brethren because by the grace of the Lord I have been visiting China for eight years, to be exact for eight and a half years on a regular basis, sometimes two or sometimes three times a year. And I know, I can tell you that I have, you have heard some of my experiences. I have had some what they would call close calls the police almost got me, one time they did, but by the grace of the Lord they let me go. So I'm with you today and not in one of Chinese prisons. Now my brothers and sisters, we need to understand and to appreciate the freedom and the liberty which we have here. Amen. And, but the most important is, even though we are free as far as the government is concerned, we need to have freedom from what? Sin. From sin, exactly. We can be free physically, yet we can be enslaved by sin. And this is what the Lord wants us, wants to do for us. And He is doing it for us. This is why He died on the cross of Calvary, to give us freedom. This is the work of Jesus, isn't it? To proclaim liberty for to those who are in prison. And today I wish to share with you, this morning we studied about grace in the Sabbath school lesson, but I wish to share with you about faith. Faith of Jesus. And I wish especially to address young people. Let me take you back many years ago about... um, let me think how many years, more than 50 years ago. Um, I also uh, uh, grew up in a communist country, as you might know. I was born in what was Yugoslavia. Um, in the beginning, when communism came to Yugoslavia after the Second World War, um, communism there was very, very hard, just probably, probably like in China or North Korea. And they forced all the people, particularly landowners, um, uh, industrialists, people who had some wealth, they caused them to or forced them to go into those collect- what they call collectives. All the private land and properties had to be, except your house where you live, had to be surrendered to the government. There was no question whether you want or not, it had to be done. And then it became what they called people's property. People's property. My father, who also was a quite a wealthy landowner, he refused. He refused to surrender his land and properties to the government. For, he resisted for about three, four years. But then a day came, and I never rem- forget this day, when two armed men came to our home with 30 other people. And they had a paper with them. They called my mother and father to come in front, in, in, in the front yard, come out of the house. And all these 30 people came. And one of the armed men, he read a Declaration, I could say. From this day, from this moment, 
the properties of my father's name, Zivan Hoz, and my mother's name, Radoslava Jaksik, all the land that they have, the properties, the, the other properties which we had in some industry, belongs to the people. In other words, all the cattle, all the horses, everything we had, all the animals, all the agricultural machinery belongs to the people. In other words, it was what I call confiscation. My mother was just crying to do nothing. But my father, of course, not being a man of faith, he started yelling and screaming and, and fighting, and there was a terrible scene. I was about 10 years old. But I remember very well, still very vividly before my eyes, what happened. And they swept, took away everything we had. They even went into the house and they ransacked the wardrobes where my mother had her clothes. She had a fur coat. In those days, the animals were slaughtered for, 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 for clothing. She had a, a wonderful fur coat, and the other things they took. And they told my mother and father, now from now on, you have to go to working collectives. However, a few years later, a number of years later, they decided to what they call re reorganize the economic situation. For they realized, the government realized, that uh, it did not quite work. People did, would not work. It was not there. And although they said it belonged to the people, yet people regarded it was not theirs. And you know, we had a, a wonderful soil there. The corn used to grow very tall. And sometimes two to three cobs on one corn. But after about uh, six or seven or ten years, on this first class soil, the corn was so high and hardly a, a cob on one corn. Just was was disaster. They decided to rearrange things and to give people some, some land back so they could be privately owned. Not much. They worked out, I forget now exactly how many acres they would give to each family back. So that, is, that could be, become a private property and people could work their land. That was, of course, a great news, wonderful news, to all, including my mother, but I must stress that my father then left my mother and never returned. She struggled by herself. And so they would call a certain number of people and they would write a letter and they said, uh, allocation of land for your family will be on that and that date. You must show on that date to receive your allocation of land. Failure to do this, you will not receive land. My mother was already a Sabbath keeper. And uh, the date for her to receive back some of the land was when? What do you think? Sabbath. On the Sabbath. On Sabbath, yes. When she received that letter, she started crying. I thought she was crying for joy. But she was crying because now it was a, an enormous temptation. Because we had no means, unless she go, or means no, no money, nothing, was enormous poverty. Unless she receives that bit of land, we will continue in this miserable poverty. But it's on Sabbath, she must go to do, take it on Sabbath. Now my uncles who were communists, even my oldest brother, who by that time became a Communist Party member, urged our mother to go to receive that land. And she agonized with the Lord, what shall she do? Then, as Friday came, the next day of being Sabbath, she would have to go 
to receive, just to sign, that's all. There would be no work involved, just to sign. At the, the urging of the neighbors, of friends, of relatives, and they said to her that if you don't go, no help, because some of the relatives were helping her a little bit, but from now on, if you do not go, no help will come to you, nor to your children, and you will be starving. And if you are dying from starvation, we'll let you die. Then Friday night, our mother called us together, because we were six children, five of us, because our older brother already was gone. My communist uncles took him away, and he was with them. Our mother announced to us that she will not go. She will not go to receive this land because the Lord's day is sacred day. Amen. And the Lord will take care of us. Amen. My brothers and sisters, I was very young at that time. But I must admit that in my heart I rejoiced for my mother. And I thought, well, I wish I had this faith that my mother has. And so the Sabbath day came and she did not go. Tragically, one of our brethren went. And this brother was the leader of our church. He was the elder of our church. And he went because he was also in that group of people to receive the land, and he got the land. And he lived but just by himself and his wife. They had no children. And this poor man later on left the church. And he died outside of the Lord. And throughout the years I observed my mother, who was very ill in her young days, but she, became, she was healed of the Lord, and she died in her 98th year. Amen. And the Lord took care of her and of us. And as I observed her life, she always, whenever difficulty came, she never complained. But she always said, the Lord will take care of us. Now, uh, so that I'm bringing an example of my mother, to me she was a, a, a woman of faith. Nothing was too difficult. On her lips was always, the Lord will do it. Trust in the Lord. And um, I often think about myself, my life. Do I have the same faith, even that faith of my mother? But do I have to have the faith of Jesus? This is what the Lord wants us to have, my brothers and sisters. And so we need to, this is why the disciples prayed. What did they pray? Lord, increase, increase our faith. And today I believe, my dear brothers and sisters, this is the prayer that we should pray continuously. That the Lord might increase our faith. To believe that the Lord can do things. Amen. You know, people have asked me, Oh, they keep asking, I should say, are there miracles in your church? Usually when you meet Pentecostal people who climb healing uh, powers and all these sort of things. I used to say, not yet. Somehow I kept telling them, not yet. But I've changed my answer. I said, yes, there are miracles in our church every day. And they ask, what kind of miracles do you have? I tell them the greatest miracle is what? Change of life, isn't it? From a sinner, from enemy of Christ, to become what? A friend of Jesus. This is the greatest miracle. Now we pray. We need to pray for this dear sister who is in China, who is in prison. But when I was in China, there was another sister who was taken by the, by the police. After she was released, I, um, I approached her and I told her, Sister, I fear for your safety. And she looked at me very surprised. And she said, Brother, what can they do for me? I am safe in Jesus. Hallelujah. All they can do is kill me. That's all they can do. But they cannot take me away from Jesus. Now this is the faith, my brothers and sisters. This is the faith which, which <clears throat> when we read 
of God's people in the past. This kind of faith we need. And as I read the lives of reformers, as they were put on the stake, and they, as they were burning, when I was in England, my son, youngest son, worked 14 months in England, and he took me, I think it's uh, Oxford or Cambridge University, I'm not sure, that the, the, the graves of, of the Lord's people who were put on the stake. And what do we read about them? When there's the fire was put, what did they do? Praising God. Praising God. And they were singing as long as the strength lasted in them. So we need this kind of faith. Faith is what? Faith is trust in God. Of course, in, in uh, Hebrews chapter 11, we know that's a, this is, I recommend young people, I recommend all of us that we should study this chapter. What is this definition of faith? Faith is? Yes, yes. The substance of things hoped for. Now, substance. What is substance? What's the word substance? Something that you can touch, isn't it? Something that you can feel. So, faith is so a substance. So, so, you are hoping for something, but you believe so much that instead of you are already having it, already feel it. And evidence, and the evidence of things not seen. Now, in the Word of God, it says very clearly to us that uh, just shall live by faith. It says in Galatians chapter 2, 2, verse 16, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by what? By the faith of Jesus Christ. And notice this uh, uh, statement always says, faith of Jesus Christ. And I will read the number of texts. Galatians 2.16 says, Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by faith of Christ. So how can we be justified? Only by faith of Christ. So we have to find out what kind of faith did Jesus have. <coughs> Not my faith or your faith. Our faith can fail very easily. We can, our faith can be uh, fluctuated by circumstances, you understand? But faith of, of Jesus did not fluctuate. It was strong continuously. And that's what we need. Uh, this kind of faith. Philippians 3, 9 says, And be found in him not having my own righteousness. And let's pray to the Lord that we do not have... Who had their own righteousness? The Pharisees, didn't they? Pharisees. We, are not to have, we are, have to have much greater faith than Pharisees, and righteousness than Pharisees. And be found in him not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but which is through the faith of, of Christ, of Jesus. That's right. This is kind of righteousness we have to have. The righteousness which is of God by faith. Oh, yes. This kind of faith, my dear friends, is young people, we need faith of Jesus. It, in, the, in genuine saving faith, there is trust in God. Through the belief in great atoning sacrifice made by the Son of God on Calvary. Christ, in Christ, the justifier, beholds his only hope and deliverer. So this is what kind, the kind of faith which, which, whenever the children of God make a failure, it is not, sorry, I, I read again, whenever the children of God make a failure. Now, notice the reason why, why we make failure, why we fail many times. It is due to their lack of faith. No, it's, so we must trust our Heavenly Father. Now let's look about Jesus, his faith. <laughs> uh, I'll read some statements of spiritual prophecy, Bible Echo. In 1892, on 15th of November, was written. He
his humanity made it a temptation to him and it was only by trusting his father's word that he could resist the power of the enemy now you must remember that Christ had no uh, privilege or greater privilege or privilege more than us he totally depended on the power of his father as a human being so he this, this wonderful faith he had he walked by faith Jesus walked by faith every moment of his life as we must walk by faith we have to be we as followers of Jesus and we call ourselves Christians we profess to be Christians we as reformers, we, this is how we should walk. We should walk by faith. Every moment of our lives. Christ would lose faith in his Father. He would trust in his Father continuously. Never for a moment did Jesus fail. Never for a moment because he walked by faith when, when he was tempted when he was tempted Satan thought to take advantage of Christ's humanity and he continued did it and urged him beyond the limits of trust into the sun, sin of presumption but while manifesting perfect trust in his father he refused to place himself in a position which would necessitate the interposition of his father to save him from death he would not force providence to his rescue and thus failed to give men an example of perfect trust and submission because we remember that Satan what did he do he wanted Christ to bow down to him and he told Christ he will, when he took him to a high pinnacle and he told him your, your father will save you now, Christ came of victor in the second temptation. He manifested perfect of confidence and trust in his father during his service, severe conflict with the power of powerful fall. Our Redeemer in the victory he again has left man, has left us a perfect pattern, showing us that his, our only safety is in firm trust and unwavering confidence in God in no trials and perils. So that's what we need to have. We have to have, and you know, my dear brothers and sisters, um, in this country, um, thank the Lord, but of course we have to fight the battles of sin and temptation continuously. And this is the, that, that is the greatest battle, actually. But when uh, your life is threatened or your freedom is threatened by persecution of those in authority, then uh, that would be, as I call, a double uh, temptation, you understand? Because you have to battle your own temptation, you have to trust in the Lord, and you have to trust in His mighty power. But then when the tempter comes, then you have to trust that your faith will not fail as Jesus prayed for, for Peter so Jesus is our perfect pattern we have to trust in him continuously, explicitly he refused to presume upon the mercy of his father by placing himself in the peril that would make it necessity for his heavenly father to display his power to save him from danger now, let me just go further. As Jesus rested by faith in his Father's care, so we are to rest in the care of our Savior. That's what we need, my brothers and sisters. We are to rest in the care of our Savior. If the disciples had trusted in him, they would have kept in peace. So this is what we are to ask ourselves. Are we, do we have peace within ourselves? Because Jesus 
said, what did he say? My peace I give unto you. Do we have this peace? Do we have this trust in the Lord? Do we continue to say the Lord will take care of things? The Lord will help us? Their fear in the time of danger revealed their unbelief. In their efforts to save themselves, they forgot Jesus. <laughs> it can happen to us as well. Let's not think, oh, how could they do it? But yes, yeah, this can happen also to us. Because sometimes we will try to, uh, to save ourselves by our, our own efforts. Our first trust in Christ should be. So, <clears throat> they forgot Jesus. And it was only when, in despair of self-dependence, they turned to him that he could give them help. Now, when Jesus was in Gethsemane, that was one of the greatest temptation for Christ. And let's have a look. Christ conquered by divine strength. That is Christ the main. He conquered by divine strength. And so must every tempted soul overcome. So how can we overcome? By divine strength. It is given to us exactly as it was given to Jesus. God was with Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane. And by the experience of Christ, we are to learn to trust our Heavenly Father. At all times and in all places, we are to believe in Him. That He is tender, true and faithful. Able to keep that which is committed to His care. In the agonizing struggle of Christ, our substitute and surety... The Father was beside His Son, and He is beside every soul that struggles with discouragement and difficulty. And that involves all of us at times, doesn't it? He is, Christ is with us always, my brothers and sisters. We must believe this, and we must trust. This is kind of faith that we need. To have the Jesus head. In order to fulfill the law, we are to carry out the golden rule and do unto others as we should would have them to do unto us. Our influence must be sanctified by the Holy Spirit of God if it is to be a blessing to humanity. We are not to be anxious as to what we will do for weeks or months or years ahead. Amen. <clears throat> Today is our day, isn't it? We don't know what will be tomorrow, but today. For the future does not belong to us. With every day as it comes, we should praise the Lord for that day. For this particular day. One day alone is ours. One day alone is ours, my dear brothers and sisters. And in Sydney, I had a very dear brother and friend of mine. We knew each other from Yugoslavia since we were teenagers. He was three years younger than I. It is now already eight years since he died. In the morning he got ill and I happened to be in Sydney and my sister called me and told me, brother, brother don't go. This brother is in hospital. So I went to see him and I uh, I rang up the airline and I told them not uh, that I will want to postpone my flight for the afternoon, thinking I could be, be, be with him two hours and then I would go. But he was gravely ill, and I postponed my flight for Sunday. And I praise the Lord that I was able to be with his brother all day. I sat in hospital room by him. By 8.30 he was dead. He died. But I pointed to him, to Jesus. And I told him to trust the Lord. So, well, he never thought he would die. He was a healthy man. But he died. So, brothers and sisters, only one day belongs to us. The future does not belong to us. One day alone is ours. And during this day, we are to live for whom? We are to live for God. 
So every morning we have what to do? To dedicate our life to live for God. Daily. As Enoch, what does the Bible say about Enoch? Enoch walked with God. So we too are to walk with our Heavenly Father. We are to walk with Jesus continuously. We are not to let go. My brothers and sisters, faith is the hand that holds unto Christ. This one day we are to place in the hands of Christ in solemn service in all our purposes and plans to be guided by Him. This one day we are to do unto others exactly as we wish them to do unto us. We are to be ready to speak kind words from hearts full of sympathy and love to everybody. Everybody we are to speak the kind words of sympathy and love. Not only those who speak this kind of words of us to us, but even those who what? Despise us, who hate us. And Jesus said, uh, Jesus did not promise that the world will love us, did he? No. What did he say? He the world will hate you, because they hated me first. Yeah. And we cannot expect to be loved by the world. Mm-hmm. But we are not to return the same hatred. We are to love, we are, as Jesus loved, not, not the, the way the world should be loved. Because John tells us, love not the world, not things of the world. But we are to love the same way as Jesus loved. In other words, to point them all to Christ. Uh, I know young people in Sydney, I probably have already told you this here, there you go. They have a public uh, a mission in some Sydney, part of Sydney, uh, first Sabbath of the month. Today, actually, first Sabbath of the month, they will go out. They go to parks, they go, but they went, first time they went to one place in Sydney that is known as a very bad place. Not recommended by anyone to go there, young people, especially our young people. But our young people went there. They set the tables, they brought food, they brought books, they brought hymn books, they brought musical instruments and started singing, praising the Lord. And some of these Poor people started gathering around. And when they, when they stopped singing, some of them came to them and they said, Why did you come here in this part of the city? You seem decent young people. No decent people come here. Because of us, the way we are. They shun us. We are the outcasts of society. And they told them, the Lord died for you as well. We care for you also. The Lord told, who told you this? The Lord told us this, to take care of you as well, to bring you the the word of life, to bring you physical food as well, to bring you clothing. As a result, there are some people coming to our church now. Yes, brethren, we have to do this work. The Lord wants us to do. This day, this one day we are to place our hands in the hands of Christ. Now, I just read the few. We are to manifest patience, revealing to the world what it means to be a practical doer of the word of Christ. We need to be practical doers, my brothers and sisters. Yes, it is wonderful to know to have a, 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 a head knowledge, as it were, to know the truth and to be able to explain it. It is a wonderful thing. But to have practical uh, uh, knowledge of truth, to put in practice in our very lives. Amen. This is important, my brothers and sisters. Um, practical doer of the word of Christ ever remembering that our life is bound up with the life of him who died for us. Christ and the child of humanity became one, so that the spirit and character of Christ are represented by his, in his followers day by day and hour by hour. 
So we are to be representatives of Jesus when? Only sometimes? Only on Sabbath? Every day. Day by day and hour by hour. We are to be Christ's representatives. By faith, Christ becomes unto the believer righteousness, sanctification and redemption. Amid the awful darkness, apparently forsaken of God, Christ had drained the last dregs of the cup of human woe. In those dreadful hours, he had relied upon the evidence of his Father's acceptance given to him. He was acquainted with the character of his Father. He understood his justice, his mercy, and his great love by faith. He rested in him, whom it had ever been his joy to obey. How did Jesus obey grudgingly or joyfully? Yes, joyfully to obey. This is the faith, my brother and sister. This is the faith of Jesus. And so he was able to overcome. And as in submission, he committed himself to God. The sense of the loss of his father's favor was withdrawn. By faith, Christ was victor. <coughs> By faith, Christ was victor. <coughs> and this is what we need to pray for, my brothers and sisters. That's why I believe disciples realized that they, did, as they observed Jesus as they followed Jesus, as they spent their time with Christ, as they talked with Him, as they walked with Him, as they had meals with Him in every uh, transaction, they realized that He was different than them. They must have lived in some kind of anxiety and fear continuously, or in some kind of hope that they would become great in this world. And as they realized this was Slipping away. And they were in danger of failing and falling continu continuously or totally. They realized that they needed that faith which Christ had. That's why they said, Lord, increase our faith. And this is what we need to pray continuously. That the Lord will give us this, this conquering faith. And that's why it's important for us to read chapter 11 of Hebrews. And then the Lord, the Spirit of Prophecy speaks, us, speaks to us here about the workers. If the workers will take hold of the faith of Christ and in humbleness of mind seek daily to bring into life, into the words and actions, the sanctification imparted by the Spirit of God, they will never fail. I read it again. If the workers will take hold of, Christ, of, of faith of Christ and in humbleness of mind seek daily to bring into the life, into the words and actions, the sanctification imparted by the Spirit of God, they shall never fail. So what is the reason that we fail, brothers and sisters? I read it again. I already read once. Why do we fail? We only fail, every failure on the part of the children of God is due to their lack of faith. Yes, yes. This is what we need. So I pray to the Lord that the Lord uh, will grant us this wonderful faith and that we shall walk with Jesus every moment of our lives. Um, we are to, just let me read in closing, my time is past. We are to encourage in one another that living faith. So when we come together, let us encourage one another and not discourage each other. <coughs> Let's, we are to encourage in one another that living faith which Christ has made it possible for every believer to have. Christ has made it possible for you and for me, every believer, to have this living faith. Amen. 
the work is to be carried forward as the Lord prepares the way. To be a Christian is to be, who can finish? Like Christ, exactly. Thank you, brother. To be a Christian is to be Christ-like. A man of faith, a man of principle. Of course, it includes everybody. So, uh, to be a Christian, to be Christ-like, is to be Christ-like, a man of faith, a man of principle. And i never forget, I told you that already here, i never forget when this lady, this policewoman, when interrogating me in China, she asked me, are you a Christian? Are you a Christian? And I had to, I've forgotten, for a moment I've forgotten even all the circumstances in which I find myself, even where I am. I just was thinking, am I a Christian within myself? Or do I just profess Christianity? Am I a Christian? She asked me, are you a Christian? She repeated again, are you a Christian? I said, yes, I am a Christian. But these words ring in my mind continuously. Every time difficulties come or temptation, are you a Christian? Am I a follower of Christ? Do I have the faith of Jesus? Do I, do, do I live the life of Christ? Do I follow Jesus every moment of my life? Do I trust in Him continuously? And am I overcomer by the faith of Jesus? Because the church of God in these last days is identified how? How is it identified? Here are they that commands of God and the faith of Jesus. So let us have this faith of Jesus, my dear brothers and sisters. And by the grace of the Lord, we, and that's right, and the patience of the saints, thank you, sister, we shall be conquerors even as Jesus conquered the enemy. And he is today in pleading for us. As he is pleading, was pleading with Peter and saying, I pray that I faith, faith fail not. The Lord is doing the same for us. And let us trust in the Lord. Let us commit our lives fully to the Lord. And fully submit to him. Because in another place, the spirit of prophecy says that strength of a Christian is where? In submission. That uh, that's, uh, sounds to the world so un unacceptable, isn't it? <laughs> the world, what do they, when they want to overcome someone or another country or enemy, what do they do? They arm themselves with guns and bombs. But for us to overcome, we need to submit. <laughs> submit to Christ. And then the overcoming power comes that is so powerful than nothing on earth, but no power on earth can overcome us. Because Christ is the greatest conqueror of universe, in the universe. No matter where we find ourselves, my brothers and sisters, whether we should find ourselves tomorrow in prison, on torture, or whatever, and don't, don't forget that will come. The enemy is preparing something for us. Probably worse than he was preparing for past generations because he wants to take us away from Jesus. And his time is coming to, to the end. He knows that very well. And he will treble or whatever, increase his hundred times his efforts in order to deceive the very elect. Mm -hmm. Let's pray to the Lord that he will not deceive any one of us, but that, that we shall hold on to Jesus. And this faith of Jesus will be ours. And we, by the, but also this faith of Jesus, we need to go to proclaim this message everywhere throughout the world, my brothers and sisters. Amen. Throughout the world. And this gospel shall be preached, well, when? Where? In all the world, for a witness. And then shall be. Might the Lord help us that we shall be more than conquerors with Jesus.